Hello, I'm Professor Paul Bingham. This is Biochemistry One. Our goal in this session is to take the first major step toward your mastery of the topic of enzyme catalysis. So we'll look at the fundamental concepts that you need, we'll solve a few simple problems, and then in the workshop and exam question section, we'll solve more complicated problems and get you to the point where you can be very confident in taking exams on this subject. Let's put this topic in context and connect it to what we've talked about up till now. So the catalysts uh, that we're going to be talking about here, enzymes are polypeptides, they're proteins. And you recall that proteins fold up in a very characteristic way, going through secondary structure into mature tertiary structure. And that mature tertiary structure is the molecular machine encoded by the original gene that produced that machine. In this section and the next couple of sections, we're going to be focused on a subset of those molecular machines, enzyme catalysts. We're going to look at how a folded protein folded in the ways that we talked about in the last few segments, that is, involving hydrophobic interactions, enthal enthalpic and entropic changes, uh, uh, influencing how a particular amino acid sequence folds up, producing a machine. What I want you to be attentive to now is that that machine has been folded up in very specific ways, as we've already talked about in earlier segments. Each amino acid side chain is arrayed in a very specific position. And that capacity for precise chemical positioning is going to turn out to be one of the ways in which enzymes do the magic they do. So to begin to understand how magical they are, let's first put them in context of a, a non-catalyzed reaction, a, a, a reaction in which no enzyme is involved. So here are what are called reaction coordinates, just the, the reactions are, pro are progressing left to right, and the free energy, notice G here at, on the vertical axis, is being plotted as the reaction unfolds. There are two different reactions here. The one at the left is, a, is a, a, an exchange reaction in which the products and the reactants have the same essential free energy. So what do you expect about that reaction? It should equilibrate with an equal mixture of the two different kinds of products, uh, reactants and products that are diagrammed here. We're more interested in general in biochemistry in, in uh, reactions like the one at the right. Notice here that the starting free energy is higher than the ending free energy. This is a, uh, a, a, f a reaction that has a favorable change and gives free energy, a negative change and gi gives free energy. This is a reaction that should go spontaneously and efficiently much further toward completion than the reaction at the right. But so this is a, a kind of reaction like our burning newspaper that you may recall from our earlier therm thermodynamic discussions, in which uh, the newspaper starts at a high free energy, you touch a match to it, it burns, poof, releases lots of heat, uh, dramatic increase in entropy with the uh, loss of order, and it, it ends up the ash in a much lower free energy state. That's what's diagrammed here. But you recall that we talked briefly th uh, earlier in the thermodynamic sections about the fact that not all newspapers burst into flame all the time. So why not? This diagram, this reaction coordinate, illustrates why not. It has to. It starts at a free energy state, but then it's got to pass through a, a higher free energy state to a higher free energy state to have an adequate level of activation to then proceed to complete the reaction. We're going to define those that term, that energy of activation, the activated state, in much more detail in the next couple of minutes. And fr it's from the understanding of that, this phenomenon of activation energy, that an understanding of how enzymes work can emerge. So it's really important to understand that concept. So we're going to use Gibbs free energy as we have been before, and you'll see that it's an extremely powerful tool in this context. So notice first the net free energy change circled in green now at the lower right on the screen. That is the net change in free energy. That's the overall release of heat, for example, in burning the newspaper. We're more interested in not the free energy of the reaction. That just tells us whether it's going to go or not, whether it will happen spontaneously or not. Here we're concerned with the rate at which it happens, and that turns out to be a function of what we'll call activation energy, what in fact is called the free energy of activation, or activation energy for short. So let's take this case and look at it a little more carefully, think it through. So if A and B are going to combine in a, uh, in a high energy state, the activated state, to then go ahead and make P and Q as diagrammed here on the image on the screen, they have to achieve this high energy state, which is symbolized here just X super double dagger, a, 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 a particular symbol that's often used in the context of activation energies. But notice what's happening here. There's an equilibrium between the coming together of A and B in the activated state and A and B them, uh, themselves, the original reactants. And so you can think of this as an equilibrium. You can write an equilibrium constant. So there's the activated state, there's the equilibrium constant, and here is how you'd write that equation. The, the equilibrium constant is the uh, concentration of the activated state over the concentrations, the product of the concentrations of the two 
products. It's uh, the two reactants, A and B in this case. So as we saw earlier in uh, other contexts, we can use the fundamental laws of thermodynamics to predict how this uh, activation energy uh, uh, will, ch how this constant will change as a function of activation energy. And before I show you that image, stop and think why we're concerned about this. The reaction rate is not determined by how much A and B you have, not directly. It's determined by what? How much X double dagger you have, how much activated compound you have, how much activated intermediate you have. So in fact, the, our concern now is to understand how that quantity, the quantity of X double dagger changes uh, uh, under various circumstances that enzymes are going to influence. So if we use basic thermodynamics, we can write very simple uh, equation. The, um, the natural log of this constant will change as the activation energy, as the energy it takes to move from A plus A and B to X double dagger. And we can write that formula as we've done earlier in the thermodynamics sections very straightforwardly. And then we uh, take the, uh, uh, the anti-log and we get the uh, f dependence of this equilibrium constant on free energy. And notice what we have here. Notice that this free energy is a negative exponent to the base of the log. E in this case. These are natural logs. So think about what that means for a minute. So as delta G gets bigger, that exponent gets bigger. What does that do to the value of, of K double dagger, the equilibrium constant between A and B and X double dagger? What, how does that change? This is a negative exponent. What does that mean? That means it's a fraction. So the larger the exponent gets, the smaller the value of the fraction. So for example, 10 to the minus 2 is 1%. 10 to the minus 6 is 1 millionth. So the bigger the exponent, the smaller the fraction. So what does that mean? That means, among other things, that as the delta G double dagger, that is the free energy of activation changes, as it increases, that uh, uh, constant that constant fraction is going to collapse catastrophically, exponentially. On the other hand, if we can reduce delta G double dagger, then in fact that uh, constant is going to uh, become much larger. In other words, the relative value of the uh, numerator to the denominator, x double dagger to a over b, is going to increase dramatically exponentially. So as we'll see over the next few minutes, that is the fundamental trick that enzymes are going to play. They're going to reach into this situation. They're going to reduce delta G double dagger. They're going to reduce delta G activation energy. And they're therefore going to increase the relative amounts of the activated state here, the, the X double dagger in this particular representation, dramatically, and thereby increase the rate of the reaction dramatically. Stop and think about that for a minute. The rate of the reaction is absolutely dependent on how much X double dagger you have. You can't get to P and Q without going through X double dagger. Look at the top of the frame, the image. Thus, if you reduce the activation energy and increase the equilibrium level of X double dagger, you will correspondingly increase the rate of reaction. And again, let me reiterate something I said a moment ago. If you, decre if you can decrease the activation energy, you will have an exponentially large effect on the rate of the reaction by having an exponential effect on the rate, the e equilibrium production of the activated intermediate. That is the fundamental trick that enzymes play. They have several different ways of going about that, as you'll see now and in the next several segments that we'll work through. But that is their trick, manipulate delta G. So here is a simple image for that, where the blue uh, uh, reaction is the uncatalyzed reaction. It has a large activation energy and goes slowly. If you could somehow reach in and reduce the activation energy, catalyzing the reaction, as it shows on, shown on the diagram, reducing the activation energy, you get an exponentially large increase in the rate of the reaction. So let's now start to build a picture of how enzymes do this this uh, simplified thing on this diagram. So let's start with simpler reactions, where a what, what in enzymology is often called a substrate, that is the original reactant, S here for substrate, is transformed into a product, P here, S and P. And spontaneously, this reaction goes on at some rate, some small rate. In the presence of an enzyme, however, the substrate will form a complex with the enzyme. And that complex will have the effect, again, for reasons that we'll come to today and over the next couple of sessions, will reduce the activation energy uh, 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 for the transitional state and will accelerate the production of P. And over the next few minutes, we want to look at how the enzyme substrate complex achieves that effect. All right. So here is a more sophisticated... <laughs>